Hey everybody, we're continuing our march through October with all the uh, crazy number of campaigns. Uh, I thought maybe we would break a thousand campaigns that I've reviewed, but it's not quite there. We'll probably hit that next week. It's been a lot, so, so many, that uh, we're just having to do it one week at a time uh, in October because they all want your money. Uh, there's some stuff that uh, you would probably get around this time next year, and uh, if you're a forward planner, you uh, will have an awesome uh, holiday and or Halloween uh, with all this crazy stuff that's coming out. Uh, a lot of this stuff can be used for kids, educators, all that kind of stuff. So uh, think about that as uh, we look through all these campaigns. Speaking of kids and educators, that's what would best be utilized with this one, Squabbles. This is a role-playing game where they talk about how to resolve certain conflicts and uh, you get cards that have different responses and uh, they have different values and you can use them. It was made by an educator that uh, goes around to various schools uh, from the look of the video middle school uh, kind of age and tells people you know here's an example of how uh, one way to resolve it right, one way to resolve it wrong and uh, that can lead to a lot of interesting stuff not just necessarily the teaching part and the healing part you could use this in uh, like family therapy even would probably you know throw a way to uh, make that part work or it could just piss everyone off in your family and all of a sudden it just leads to more you know crazy chaos and arguments that depends on who you are and what your family is uh, you can look at the page and go from there but I think even like a drama class or anything like that uh, you know just uh, you know just a, a troop of some kind of, of young people that you have to uh, to teach uh, whatever your your brand of troop is, then uh, it might be useful for that as well to have a an interesting time above something like charades. And Gameland Games is soon going to be in, having uh, their tiny epic dinos, but before that, you can get some big old dinos. These are bigger than your normal action figures, so they're not quite to scale, but pretty close. Uh, they don't have feathers though. They have lots of uh, interesting coloration. So if you're one of the people that thinks that uh, dinos of a certain age or certain type would have feathers, then uh, maybe it's not wholly accurate for you. But the art looks pretty neat. Um, the sculpts look pretty good, uh, similar to what you would have had in uh, maybe Dino Riders. And uh, if you're going to do Chult from uh, Temple of Annihilation or uh, some other game, there was Dino Wars and some other ones from before that were skirmish games that used dinosaurs and interesting things, uh, you could use these instead. Or if you just like collecting them, that's uh, an uh, option for you too. Right now they're just doing the Ceratops. There were a lot of different uh, types uh, and a lot of different controversy. Keep in mind, people think that the Triceratops is a juvenile Duoceratops. Uh, yeah, then there's some with lots more horns and different things along the ridge, different types and whatnot, so you can pick your favorite if you are into dinosaurs. Then we have a new spin on an old game. This is Castles. This is supposed to be a spin on chess. Um, I think part of the reason why they're not funding at their $40,000 goal is most people have a chess board and they can just look at the rules and apply it to their current game, which makes it uh, difficult to say that you should have a boxed product. Maybe they'd uh, be better off if they just uh, had a much smaller goal and offered uh, you know some PDF or something on the rules that people could use. Their uh, idea being that there are fortifications at the edge of each board and each character, or not necessarily character, but side, um, has to defeat the fortifications uh, or as you move into the center of the board, you're no longer at your fortification, you're now out into the open field, so the rules change up a little bit for that. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe it'll work, uh, but I don't think people are so into chess or that this is going to change this up for people that aren't into chess uh, to make it required. Um, the people that are super into chess, I don't think they need further gamification because just that's not the type of game that it is. Now we have a super duper value. This is a dozen Sinister Rumors, but not only uh, for the rumors, for a dollar you could get their other PDFs. The Sinister Rumors themselves are uh, just things that you can throw out in a bar uh, in your RPG. You don't necessarily have to use them in fantasy. You can probably tweak these for uh, whatever setting it is that you want. Just take the idea of it and keep going. Um, they're also spell components, city encounters, dungeon treasures, lots of dungeon stuff. Uh, they're offering a lot for basically a dollar. They're well-funded uh, into this. It's a neat little 
eight page uh, piece that uh, you know just makes it so that you uh, you don't necessarily run out of ideas when you need to, something or uh, if it even if you don't use it it may spark inspiration to try something else so that's the the main uh, reason for using these type of things is just to overcome uh, writer's block in the moment and just have something ready to go then we have a tiny game made up of only 17 cards and that is hierarchy this is a game that uses you see these yellow cards there there's only 17 of them and uh, then you have these edicts and uh, they have yellow and purple sides basically the values that you see and the text that you see you and another player will flip the cards back and forth lay them on top of each other to different effects and you score your uh, points at the end and see who wins so something that can go pretty quickly uh, it's just two players so fairly simple very very small so uh, if you wanted to play with somebody at work or whatever the case is you could or you could just keep them in that handy dandy little case they've, they've got there so a neat little game then we have a game for grandma's house on the holidays and that's arch revels uh this is about knitting and making things they call them fiber arts i'm sure not they're not the only ones that call them that but uh it's the first time i've heard of it uh, I do have an aunt that uh, she likes to make quilts all the time. So if we wanted to try to connect and uh, play a game with them or get the kids to play a game with, uh, with them, then uh, you know, associating it with uh, a popular activity of theirs would be a great way to get everybody to, to play something and, and be a part of something and maybe share some stories at the same time. Um, I found out about this game because the guys from Blacklist are or had uh, backed it. So uh, I guess uh, one of the guys are going to play with their daughter or whatever the case is, or uh, maybe take it, to, like I said, to grandma's house. Who knows? But it's a neat, very simple game. It has some resource management. So uh, if you did have a smaller uh, person with you, a younger person, and you wanted to teach them about, uh, you know, managing their resources, then uh, this might be an interesting nonviolent way to do so. Then we have some more miniatures for your... Uh, whatever tabletop skirmish uh, RPG needs and these are the bloody elven army so you have the elves they look a lot like the ones from Helm's Deep uh, with, with those uh, helmets um, so if you wanted something that was similar to uh, what Peter Jackson threw out there in uh, the Lord of the Rings the first set uh, here you go um, they look like they uh, are about the same size as what you get in Zombicide Maybe you could play them against even Song of Ice and Fire or any of your other Blood Rage or other games uh, that you're using minis with. And uh, lots of different options for these guys. Not necessarily bloody here without all the paint on them, but that part is up to you. But you can have mounted, unmounted, uh, along with their traditional uh, bows that you see in a lot of different parts of fiction. Or uh, these uh, two-handed swords that uh, I haven't seen in a lot of places that make them look almost samurai-like. But uh, yeah, they look good. If you are a fan of uh, Root and all the cutesy little critters, then uh, you may be also interested in playing a roll top or a tabletop role-playing game with them. And now you have your chance. Uh, the books look neat. Um, it's going to have the same kind of graphics and everything that the uh, regular tabletop uh, board game has had. And uh, I don't know which system they're going to use if they're going to base it off of anything or they're going to try to integrate it with the rules of um, the regular board game. But if you had a favorite character, or you had a favorite mission, or anything like that, now would be your time to expand upon that. Uh, again, another neat way to maybe uh, bring other friends of uh, different types, or maybe friends, kids, or whatever the case is, into a different type of gaming. Uh, or if you've never jumped in on Root and you just want uh, a cutesy, cartoony uh, tabletop RPG, then uh, here's another option for you. Um, there's a bunch of them that we've looked at over the last thousand, uh, nearly 1,000 games. Um, this probably is going to be one of the most successful considering how they're already at $400,000. You're going to have at least 4,500 backers with seven days to go. I'm going to say that's going to shoot close to 6,500. Uh, lots and lots of people will be around playing this, uh, so you'll have... Uh, other people to compare notes with, which is always hard when trying a new RPG, but uh, I think you'll have enough support going forward with this one. Then we have Dead Throne. This is a revised edition. You get some language packs, and uh, the art is uh, not as refined as some of these other uh, fantasy RPGs, but they seem to, in the rules, have looked at a bunch of different things that people don't enjoy and fixed them, one of which is the having to wait for other players so they don't have 
uh, they have a mechanism in there, so everybody's kind of going at the same time, doing their own thing, trying to uh, get their own stuff. Um, the maps are kind of dynamic in the sense that you can lay the tiles out any way you want. They're in these hexes. Uh, the certain spells will allow them to spin or flip or do other crazy things. Um, you'll have lots of different options, so basically you're not going to run out of boards. And uh, everyone has their own uh, thing that they're trying to do in this world. And as you change the world, it will affect the other players. So there's that level of competition. Also a solo mode. So uh, think about that if you need something that is a little bit lighter of an RPG. They are also cost conscious. So they have standees and miniature options. So if you uh, don't want to uh, pay extra for miniatures, you don't really care about that. You don't have to. So uh, they've uh, spent a lot of time over there at Sharky Games thinking about you. Give them at least a look. Fortunately, these guys at Pentagame t uh, said more about what this game is like rather than what this game is. They made a big deal about the game being on a five-sided star. Who cares? What does it play like? What does it feel like? It's like, oh, it's for very experienced players. Well, very experienced players are going to be able to see through a thin veneer of crap. So uh, at the same time as uh, saying that, I would recommend fully having it explained in the rules and in whatever it is that you need uh, and what the game is like, how it plays with two, three, four people, what the case is. Um, this is basically the rules as you see it up there, but uh, I don't know. I, it's, it's hard to say what makes it not a waste of time. Um, game crafter components, basically. So uh, it'll be cheap. Um, nothing especially interesting as far as art. Um, yeah, I don't know. If you just like these things or you find it interesting, then, uh, then maybe it'll be, you know, for you. But I think some of the other uh, developers of these inexpensive game crafter games work a little harder and might be more worth your money. Speaking of art, came across some beautiful stuff by Frederick Cooper. This is Vera Knox and uh, the monster art of Frederick Cooper. Uh, you can just see for yourself. It's amazing. Um, great. It's so realistic. Every little piece. Uh, yeah, you could go watch the movies, but... Uh, some of these guys, uh, you know, don't exist that way, right? Um, you just have to appreciate. Every once in a while, you see something pretty spectacular. And uh, the way that he's able to capture the lighting, and the expressions of the faces and everything is just, it feels so much of that uh, universal horror. Um, I mean, it looks like that's, uh, you know, the picture of the crow down there with uh, Brandon Lee. It looks like it's a actual photograph. So uh, if you want to see some amazing work, you can uh, pick this up yourself and uh, get all Halloween-y. Then we have a culturally significant one. This I'm not even going to bother to pronounce. If I had to guess, uh, anglicize, it's Dia Linh Nan Kiet. It's a Vietnamese game. I used to have a Vietnamese roommate. Still owes me money, so I'm not going to hold it against uh, you know this game for that because that would be pointless. Uh, anyway, the uh, art looks pretty cool. Very cartoony, a little bit on the style of Samurai Jack. Um, mixed with Powerpuff Girls, maybe. Uh, lots of neat uh, illustrations. I'm not sure how the game plays at all because it uh, doesn't really describe how the game plays. So uh, there's that. Maybe this is a, a popular game in Vietnam uh, or in San Jose. I don't know. Uh, you can put it down in the comments if you know, and uh, otherwise you can check out the game if you like the artwork that you see. Then, if you ever wanted to make your own space opera, here you go, Aces in Space. This runs on the Fate Core system. So uh, there is some compatibility with a game system that's already out there. So if you have any questions, you can uh, go back and forth on it. Um, the idea being that you are a fighter pilot and you better be exciting. There's no point in being a mundane fighter pilot. You're supposed to go out there, blow up the bad guys, come home and talk as much trash as possible and uh, that's what it's supposed to be all about everybody just gets together and uh, pew 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 knocks the uh, other guys out of the sky uh, and uh, you know tells their buddies about it later makes fun of them does a whatever flyby whatever craziness you need to get the new uh, Top Gun is coming out in a month maybe two months and uh, maybe you're gonna get all excited for uh, dog fighting it and uh, this will be a good way to, to further that enjoyment out. Uh, take a quick look at Aces in Space, especially if you're already a player of Fate and uh, you know how that system runs.
If you're out there in the verse, maybe you need some terrain to explain what's going on. Uh, while these are things you could fly around, not necessarily fly in, Sector Corvus Prime has 3D printable sci-fi terrain. So maybe it is where you're landing, uh, you know, play Starfinder, whatever the case is, whatever it is that you're going to play in a sci-fi setting. Uh, maybe you need some 40K terrain, whatever the case is. Uh, they have lots of neat 3D printable stuff. There's uh, quite a bit of overhang, so I would recommend uh, having a good uh, printer. Um, I'm not sure how the tiles all go together. Uh, I would say probably not a good idea to try this on a very small system, uh, something that's uh, more in line with like a Prusa Mark II or Mark III. Uh, similar build space would probably be best bets for you. Uh, but there are a lot of flat surfaces, so I think a regular FDM will be just fine. In the 80s, I used to play uh, Sim Earth on my dad's Mac Plus 2, little tiny black and white screen, and it was so much fun. Learned so many things about the planets and uh, what goes on and how to build one. That's kind of what Entropia is about. You play a solar system that is trying to be created, and uh, it's got solo mode. It seems to be running pretty quick. The art's neat. Um, I'm not sure how much you're going to learn. Uh, as most of these planetary uh, constructions are just theoretical uh, that we know of, and that's what the game is going to be based on. But, uh, you know, it's still got a lot of cool art, interesting. Um, there is a violence, but it's not a violence with weapons, because you're going to be eating planets. Uh, so it's a little bit different in the way that you think about it. Um, and that's, that's why you should take a look at it. If you want uh, just a different viewpoint, something entirely different than any other type of game, an entirely different way to think, and uh, still kind of stay in that sciencey zone, Entropia. Then we have some more models and maps and other cool stuff for Jinda Hikari. These are uh, spaceships. So if you need more spaceships, if you uh, are playing with uh, that the Aces one we were looking at before, or you're playing uh, with the Sector Corvus stuff, whatever the the deal is, not necessarily from any particular universe, but uh, you know, able to be used in just about anything. A little bit on the reminiscent side of some uh, Star Wars, uh, different like what, like A-Wing maybe? Uh, or, you know, maybe some Battlestar Galactica. Lots of different types. They're all in there. Uh, inspirations abound. And, uh, you know, it seems neat. Even if you watched uh, Space Above and Beyond, if you remember that show against the bugs, uh, some of the ships look similar there too. So, you know, lots of different options for your Starfinder or any other Traveler, whatever space game you want to play. Then we have a first war game, and this is Philadelphia 1777, Worthington Publishing. If you uh, need British versus the American uh, colonials, then uh, here you go. 1776 is when uh, it was declared that the United States would exist, um, at least as a non-colonial power. And uh, 1777 is when fighting gets started. Mail didn't work very fast back then, so you got to mail it out, you know, on a ship, and then they get mad and then they make some decisions and they got to bring on a boat back and tell the people in Canada to come down and attack. You know, 1777. All right, makes sense. You know, nobody's doing anything in the winter. All right, so come on down in the summer and that's when the fighting starts. Makes sense. Philadelphia being, uh, you know, sisterly, uh, brotherly love, I believe is the name, but it's also one of the first uh, capitals of uh, the colonies or United States, whatever they were at the time. There you go. If you want a war game, get it on. Then we have a humorous take of inclusion. This is Adventuring with Pride. Not only is it a supplement that throws in some hilarious LGBT characters, there's minis available. Um, this one is more like the orc drag queen, but there's also like a, I think it's like a gnome leather daddy uh, from the look of things. And then, uh, you know, just a, a female in uh, what is considered a non-dress or male clothing type of thing, and you have the possible male orc in the female clothing with the bejeweled axe and all kinds of stuff with the lipstick and all that funny business going on. Uh, I prefer that when people want to throw a wrench into the works and make it their own, um, that you use a regular system uh, like uh, 5e to bring the people in to your world uh, or play with others and at least they'll have an idea of what the game is about. There's so much more stuff out there for 5e that once you're, you're going to run out of what's in your book or in your world really, really quickly. 
and it'd be great to still be able to include other 5e stuff. So maybe you have a, a transgender dragon. Who knows what kind of craziness is, is uh, going to happen in your world. You should have as much humor as these people are having with it and not take yourself too seriously in any kind of way and uh, just have fun with it. And I think adventuring with pride is also adventuring with fun and you should pick it up if uh, you like it. Then if you play Torchbearer Sagas, this is the Vagrant's Guide to Surviving the Wild. Uh, all black and white, but the art looks pretty good still. Um, this is about all of the things that happen in between towns. So if you're out traveling about, going from one place to another, all kinds of crazy encounters can happen for you. Uh, I haven't played Torchbearer Sagas. Looks like there's a lot of dice involved, um, other tokens and other things. Um, but, uh, you know, maybe you'll pick it up just uh, out of curiosity, um, or you like the art, or... You can use some of the ideas in here to uh, randomize or create new uh, new quests for other games as well. And we have a two to four player game about Vikings, Blood of the Northmen. Uh, so as you move around the board, you unlock different tiles, you go across the roads, you do different stuff. And uh, that uh, allows you to build up strength because you take over different pieces, recruit more people. It's a miniatures game as well. So uh, it's not just tiles and whatnot, but uh, at a certain point, you're going to come into conflict with each other because that's what Vikings do. They fight. Not really. They did a lot more trading than anything else, but that's what we think Vikings do. We think they fight. Then we have straight out of the pulp magazines, pulp figures, dangerous dames, 28 millimeters of all kinds of uh, bad assery of these ladies. Um, you can have... Basically, you, if you're a stereotype of the Orient, if you're a stereotype of uh, Bonnie and Clyde, or you're a stereotype of uh, Aleister Crowley, then uh, you're covered. I think uh, Ninjas and Super Spies would be my ideal use of these figures. Not many people playing that, though, so possibly in some form of uh, an Arkham Horror. Uh, maybe even like Delta Green or something you could uh, throw these guys in. Or uh, just casual racism. Why not? Throw that in there too, <laughs> um, with uh, these very stereotypical uh, martial arts Asian women doing that kind of stuff. Um, at a certain point in history, there was nobody else who was doing that <laughs> because it hadn't been brought over to the West. So maybe you're going to play that one through. Um, a lot of these uh, ladies could be singers. They don't all have to be, you know, holding the guns. It depends on how uh, you want to play it. Uh, the altars and all that with the uh, sacrifices, I think those ones look the absolute best, though. Lots of different dangerous names for you to look up. Then we have Pebbles. This is about sea glass hunting. I don't know what sea glass is. Is that garbage? Someone let me know. Part of the game is picking up garbage, though. So I still think it is garbage. Um, the sea, as far as I can tell, doesn't have the ability to reach the temperatures, unless it was in a volcanic area, maybe. And the volcanic vents, and somehow it was, you know, mixing with the sand and, and causing it to shoot back up. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I think it wouldn't go up. I think it'd go back down. That's closer to the ground. You know, I just, I think it's garbage. Anyway, the uh, the game, you run around the beach and you pick up various types of sea glass for various um, whatever uh, values they are, and you're looking for the the best ones. So if you are a fan of this hobby, the way that it makes uh, the, the the creator makes it sound from See Him UK, uh, then, uh, you know, you know that this would be fun. Um, I'm going to guess that the mechanics of the game will still make it fun, even if you do just think it's picking up trash or whatever. Uh, that should be something that uh, still should make people want to uh, help the environment a little bit, clean things up, in, especially if they can have some fun and you can train your kids to uh, do the same. Then we have another uh, space game. This one includes bit of exploration though and uh, there's different tokens different types of fuels you can pick up politics cards for uh, favor from factions of different places as you can see it's this uh, this round uh, system that you put in and uh, each planet has a different color and different things that they can do they also have different resources they want different resources they provide so uh, as you try to gain favor uh, with your friends then uh, you know you go back and forth and there's a lot of replayability and that kind of cool stuff not necessarily something for uh, for everybody but uh, at least it has a solo mode which uh, means it would at least be fun for me I'd like to be able to uh, play this first though 
to see if it really is. The little miniature uh, spaceships look kind of neat, though. Uh, if you want to click down on the description below to uh, to see uh, them for yourself. All right, and then we have time editors, which I, I guess and maybe it looks a little bit like Pandemic in space. It's hard to say because uh, they spend so little time again telling you what the game is. I honestly don't care about anything else other than what the game is. Uh, tell me about whatever whiz bangery you throw into it after you tell me what the game is how does it play they have these little dumpster uh, trucks that run around drop things off this is supposed to be a, a representation of a four-dimensional system because you're supposed to be able to go back and forth in time and do various things um there's oh the gameplay is done this that the other thing did you spend so much time on the gameplay that <laughs> you forgot to tell people about it i, I don't know what the case is um, they're struggling right now, and uh, I would, if I were them, I would change the main page up as much as possible to get this is what the game turns are like. Throw that on there, get it as as vibrant on the page as possible, uh, because that's what's holding you back right now. You're not showing. It's too. When you watch the video, the guy's like a, in a suit, and it's like super corporate. You got to be relaxed with a game. Either you put on, you want to wear a suit, go put on a space suit. You know what I mean? It, it, it's too much like a like a noir detective confessional, and not like an explanation video of something that's supposed to be fun. Speaking of fun, downtime's no fun, but now it can be with Traveling Encounters Volume One. These are uh, low uh, challenge rating, one to five adventures that happen while you're just walking around. Um, if you have uh, a world that is just based on uh, like Faroon or whatever the case is, then uh, this would be pretty handy. If you're going to use something like Temple of Annihilation, which I mentioned before, it's pretty specific on uh, what areas are around. It might be a little more difficult to integrate something like this. Um, but uh, there, if you're trying to help someone out who's just getting there with uh, dungeon mastering or uh, it's their first time playing through, then uh, these little type of adventures may make for a whole campaign or, uh, you know, just try to encourage someone to jump in. Um, that's pretty much the thing that you miss out on the most. Everybody plays uh, Fendelver and, uh, yeah, if you bought a bunch of supplements, maybe you have um, low, uh, low level stuff. But uh, I think you could always use some more, especially if you're going to make everyone start over and give them a unique experience. Take a look and see if these are unique and interesting enough for you and your gamers. But maybe you want to play the monsters, and that's what Castle Conquest is about. Uh, you can play as the ghosts, the vampires, the skeletons, all that crazy goodness. Um, as you try to flip over tiles and make your way into the castle, you have to uh, explore and try to get a key in order to get in. So uh, there's that part of it. Um, lots of different options. They call it a family game, but then they called it also a kinky quest. To me, that's mixed messages <laughs> um, if you read through the whole thing. So uh, yeah, it, the guys are here in Los Angeles. If I ever meet them, then I'll try to figure out what it is they meant by that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, it says there's a solo mode. So uh, if you do want to play this by yourself, you can. Uh, yeah, does look cute and neat. Maybe they just had one really bad word for choice when they put this thing together. Now we have another chessboard. This is the Glass Knights. I know a lot of people, because they were super cheap at a certain point, had these shotgun chess sets. It's not, not shotgun, shot glass chess sets. I think people gave me like two of them. Um, but this is different. This is actually molded into different shapes and uh, you can put the booze inside or you can put liquid inside depending on how you want and uh, you could drink from them afterwards after they've been taken so you could change it into the game where like oh i took your your guy or whatever now you have to take a shot of whatever's in it and uh, those are all options or uh, because they're glass and frosted glass you can just change the colors to whatever uh, uh, fluid that you want um, something that is uh, healthy, <laughs> hopefully not too toxic, and uh, those are all options, different things you can do. Um, if you just want something unique that's not just in the shape of shot glasses, like those uh, cheaper ones that came out maybe 20 years ago. 
Then we'll move on to some more fantasy miniatures. We have the Greenskin Wars, Greenskin Hunters. Uh, there's a lot more options than what's just shown here, but if you need some Orcs, Goblins, uh, or anything similar to that, and you want it in metal, then uh, Greenskin Wars has lots of different options available for you. You can use them for whatever uh, game that you want. It's part of the full range. It's just called Greenskin Wars, and this particular grouping is called the Greenskin Hunters. So if you see these uh, wax uh, castings, they're usually ones I've seen are green. It means they're going to be done in metal. Um, you're going to have to think about what kind of paint you're going to use. They're obviously going to be much heavier than plastic, so you think about how you're going to uh, display them. And uh, they can dent, <laughs> which is a little bit different. Uh, and they also, uh, they, they're not brittle. They're um, capable of being bent over a little bit. Uh, so uh, metal has its own challenges, and just see if that's what you want in your games. Then we have a different kind of RPG. This is for you to play with a three-year-old. So it says three and up. I don't know how you're going to get a three-year-old to say enough coherent stuff to really t make a story work out, but maybe they can, uh, you know, regurgitate back some decisions and then, you know, maybe they can draw some stuff. Uh, the earlier you could start a kid, you know, using their imagination and, uh, you know, it'd be great. Uh, kids seem to do all this stuff just on their own, not necessarily with rules or anything. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, if you uh, just want to challenge them and uh, try to, instead of just telling them a story, build the story with them, then uh, this is an option. Uh, I know a lot of people have kids, and uh, a lot of people like things like Monsters, Inc., and maybe if they think that there's a scary monster under their bed all the time or whatever the case is, then uh, uh, maybe this will help them get over it. Uh, different options. Take a look, see if it'll be right for your kids. When I was three, uh, we had these little golden books and that's what I'd read all the time. Um, but I didn't start playing D&D &D and all that till I was seven. I'd be interested to see how they kind of mitigate that. Uh, I don't know if the kids will be able to handle the dice rolls, but uh, yeah, give them a shot. Then we have oregano and that's how you say it. It is oregano, not oregano. Weird, weird British people. You gotta learn how to say stuff. I heard somebody, they couldn't it's called in Miles Morals instead of Miles Morales. You live next to Spain. You vacation there. How can you not figure out how to say Morales? Ugh, what culture? I'm calling you out, what culture? You can't pronounce stuff. Anyway, the uh, the game is basically Uno with uh, out the, the sets of, uh, or numbers that you have to connect to different things. Instead, they are uh, types of uh, vegetables. So... Uh, if you want to teach kids about vegetables, maybe what you want to plant in your garden, different things. Planting season, I believe, is in February. So if you get this by then, then uh, maybe you can start talking to them about it. And uh, before they start munching down on it, you can educate them just a little bit and uh, get kids a little bit excited about veggies. Uh, I see a blight card there, so there is a little bit different from uh, Uno, but it basically runs the same. You're just matching suits. Then we have another game to get your kids indoctrinated young into the fantasy world. This is for kids five and up. Quest Kids. Uh, thankfully, these are standees so that when they uh, leave them on the ground or whatever, it's not going to hurt. Uh, although some of those gems look like they could be a Lego level of pain if left on the carpet <laughs> and you step on it at night. Um, but yeah, the just a very simple fantasy dungeon crawl. Uh, simple mechanics. I don't know if the kids will necessarily be able to play on their own, but it would be great to be able to try to get them to do that. So later in life, they can, uh, you know, run games themselves and other cool stuff. So uh, yeah, 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 you know, Quest Kids, take a look at the rules and see if it applies for you and yours. And we're back to stuff for the big kids at Ulfheim. These are Stone City stuff for uh, your 3D printer. Whatever type of city you want, if you want it to be ruined, if you want it to be an Eskimo uh, type of hut, uh, Inuit, whatever right term for people of the north is, um, then you have uh, what almost looks like a Fallout uh, type of uh, crazy thing that could have come out of Ready Player One. All different types of options uh, are available to you. Um, I think FDM would be fine. There's no need in the world for uh, resin on this stuff. It'll probably just break anyway. So uh, some regular old PLA will probably look fantastic. And if you need some custom figures for that, we have Wasteland 2 from RN Studio. 
And uh, so you got some tentacle beasts. You got uh, some maybe uh, I don't know uh, cowboys, ranger types, uh, all different various versions of uh, things that you could find out in the post-apocalypse. Uh, lots more options are there. This just happened to be the best graphics uh, to show to you. There are way, way more on the page itself. So if you're looking for more things that kind of fit into this world, almost the Fallout type world, Gasland, whatever you're looking for, give it a look. Then if you need yourself some mysticism and mythic uh, adventures in the role-playing worlds, uh, before Aeon Trespass shows up, you can get yourself Aegon, which is a role-playing game that takes place basically in uh, the times of myths and legends. So uh, if you want to be Perseus, if you want to be Andromeda, if you want to be uh, Hercules, if you want to be any of those types of heroes, if you want to be Jason, never forget him, uh, then uh, this might be an RPG set up just for you. Um, they, uh, I don't think it's based on 5e. I, I don't think it's based uh, on basically anything. They're using something with a strife system. Uh, so not something I'm familiar with, but, uh, you know, if, uh, it says one roll resolution. All right. So you, maybe you don't have to, uh, steal too much with dice. If you got hundreds of dice and all the different types of stuff that can complicate things for a lot of people, but, uh, being able to throw out a, a myth of some kind and have them play through the myth, uh, might be just familiar enough to get a new player involved, especially if they have a, uh, an interest in, uh, Greek mythology. Then one number is telling me that this is the thousandth uh, one we've covered, but another one says it's a little bit of ways. I'm going to go with the higher number, um, and uh, we'll cover that next week. We have Celtic knot pins and Norse rune coins. Um, I, I don't need pins, but a lot of people like to put them on various parts of clothing. I think it's unnecessary, uh, but uh, if you're into it, you're into it, and no one should be able to stop you from uh, jazzing yourself up in any kind of way. You can put all the flair you want. You just get your Friday's outfit on. Um, and then uh, the coins. Now, if you're running a campaign like with Aegon uh, or uh, Trudvong or uh, one of the other uh, Norse types of games, then uh, these uh, runic symbols or Celtic knots will uh, be very handy to hand to your players if uh, you want to give them a reward or just have it as like a quest token or anything like that and uh, make it a lot more tactile. That, that does help out. Then we have Cosmic Colonies. This is about colonizing asteroids. These are worker drafting games that allows you to build uh, certain buildings uh, and put certain resources on your home asteroid. Neat, two to five players, so you're gonna need somebody else to uh, be as excited about it as you are. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's neat. If the uh, ship, the Nostromo had actually uh, done what it was supposed to do in Alien, then they might be doing what's on this instead of being attacked by Xenomorphs, right? Never stop to uh, to help anyone in space because they're always going to be a problem. You know why they stopped in the first place? Because they had a problem. It's going to be your problem. You know, you don't have that problem. You get out there and you mine those asteroids. That's how you make it work. You stick to the plan and you get the gold or whatever you have to get out of those asteroids. Probably iron and nickel. That's probably what's out in the asteroid. Anyway, uh, yeah, you know, a tangent aside, you need a, a worker uh, placement and, and a card drafting game that takes place in space. Cosmic Colonies. Then if you're down to get spooky, we got the Ghost Betwixt. This is about someone getting lost in the 1990s in uh, basically someone's haunted house. Uh, it will be delivered around this time next year, so... You know, you buy now and you can play later. Or you can play right now, too, if you notice, put that little icon right there. Because uh, they have a print-and-play option that you can play either in Tabletop Simulator or uh, just print it out for yourself. So uh, think about that. See if it's a game that you'd like. And uh, if you want the full version ready to go next year, then uh, back it now. And, uh, you know, it's got a neat little theming going on. It's a little something for everybody. But, uh, you know, just keeping in mind, rabid ferrets, they're out there. And if Savage Worlds is your flavor and you're just looking for something a little more uh, high fantasy to throw in with it, Gods and Masters. Uh, this is about a city under siege. Uh, lots of different factions are involved. Uh, so, you know, it sounds interesting. Uh, it is based on Savage Worlds, so I think it's going to take a little bit of tweaking if you wanted to just put it into 5e. But uh, it is a mature system. Uh, there's 
at least a couple of these a month. So there's plenty of people that are out there playing Savage World. It's uh, kind of a stripped down RPG uh, system compared to uh, one of the crunkier ones, especially more than Palladium. Uh, <laughs> and what they have it takes forever to get through anything. So uh, if this is uh, something that sounds interesting to you, I mean, it's basically the same, more of the same stuff that you would get in just about any other high fantasy thing. But if you don't have 100,000 books uh, already and you're looking for something contemporary with the uh, artwork that looks like this, does not look bad at all, then uh, take a look at Gods and Masters. Now break out your bratwurst and your polka shoes. Paul and Storm Sausage Party is based on a song actually and if you click on the video it will play the song it sounds very much like a weird owl song would uh except that it's not a uh, a cover parody it's just a parody song uh based on uh the uh, phallic look of sausages and they do it all in this very cartoony way and it seems to uh, still be wholesome even though uh it is about uh getting drunk at oktoberfest and uh you can feel however way you want to do that about your friends or family, youngins or, or oldens, and uh, what they would do. I personally haven't been to Oktoberfest yet this year, went uh, a couple times before, and uh, Alpine Village out here has a little deal where they have beers and uh, various German foods. I'll probably go this week. We'll see how it goes. I'll see if I have any time. Then we have a game, Vamp on the Batwalk that is a little bit social destruction and a whole lot of uh, fashionable. So here's the thing. You are not allowed to look at the cards in your hand. Everyone else can look at them, just not you. So you have to read their reactions and uh, base up what card you're going to play on that. Uh, I think that's an interesting dynamic. It's a little weird. Uh, <laughs> uh, the box is the runway, so that part looks pretty neat. It's got Sandies. It's totally fine. Uh, seems like a very inexpensive, neat uh, little game. Uh, if you order it now, you get it by uh, Halloween next year, and that'll be nice. Um, if you're into fashion and vampires, maybe this would be a little more popular when the Twilight thing was going on. But, uh, yeah, you know, same kind of thing. And this episode was so chock full of stuff that I even had to go in and uh, find three characters that I could remove to get under the uh, 5,000 character limit. We're at $49.99. We uh, just got there by one. So, uh, yeah, packed everything in that I could. And October is still just filled to the brim with so much stuff out there uh, that people are, uh, are putting out as games. Lots of good ones, lots of interesting ones. Maybe they're not always for you. Next week, I'll try to also cover uh, Zombicide uh, 2.0 just a little bit. Maybe I'll go into more depth and do like a full episode later and talk about Legacy and all that to see how much time I've got. Uh, there's also going to be Dawn of Madness coming up uh, around uh, Halloween, Hour of Need right after Halloween. Those are all going to be big campaigns, fun, interesting stuff. Uh, if you have any comments, questions, concerns, anything you want to tell me, any campaigns you're really interested in, throw those down in the comments. Uh, like I said, next time we'll be at number 1,000. 1,000 campaigns so far and uh, not even a year. So that, that'll tell you just, uh, you know, every week coming out, it's been uh, 10 months, eight months, something like that. We go through a lot of campaigns. Tell me how you guys are doing. Still no one's told me what they want to be for Halloween. Throw that in there. Have a good one.